But uh, I've tried this system by accident one year, and because I was using a, a hive for raising queens and using a cloak device, I wound up leaving the queen, uh, the queen excluder on there by accident. I came back and oh my gosh, I left the queen excluder on. Because guys, I had a list of all the reasons why single brood nests wouldn't work. And what I found was the bees had moved out the honey and moved it up on top, up above the queen excluder, and the queen had a beautiful brood nest. So the next year, I tried it with two or three, and again, the same scenario this year, I, I did 13, so I've done an experiment. So what I'm recommending, if you like this system and you think you might, and let's just say you got two hives, next year try one. <coughs> I, I think what he's going to bring to us is going to help us a bunch. So, Don, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me over here from Joplin. Um, really appreciate it. We're excited to do this. Um, we're hoping to do more stuff between clubs. We've been talking about it in Joplin a little bit. Um, in that vein, <clears throat> right now we're working on doing a video presentation with um, Randy Oliver. Um, we were trying to bring him here, but he said, uh, you know, he'd rather stay at home and work on stuff, and he wants to cut down his carbon footprint and not fly as much. But he does Zoom presentations, which is live video conferencing, and you can do questions and answers and so forth. We're kind of aiming for November 2nd for that over at Missouri Southern. So, um, And we're going to invite all the other clubs to come to this thing, and we're also going to try and put together some other speakers. So anybody who wants to volunteer to speak at this thing, you can try out your <coughs> bee clinic thing on November 2nd, the week before. Um, <laughs> Going to talk about single brood box management. You know, every hobby has a handful of hot button issues. Um, scuba diving, do it right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Do it right or. Uh, how long? How long is your? <coughs> how long is your regulator hose? Which BC? The, the, every hobby has these things that people talk about back and forth. This is one of them in beekeeping. The other things are stuff like queen excluders, <coughs> etc. Um, single brood box versus double brood box. So. We're going to talk through some of the practicalities of doing single brood box. I was asked to do this on single brood box versus double, but um, it started to feel adversarial, and none of this is meant to be adversarial. You know, my disclaimer whenever I do one of these talks about bees is <coughs> they are your bees. Do whatever you please with your bees. This is information about this. So um, you have to evaluate what your goals are for your beekeeping and what you want to do, what makes you happy, what you think makes your bees happy. So it's just information about doing this with one brood box. Um, <clears throat> I, I also have taught online before and uh, I, I've taught nurse practitioner students quite a while and I've taught in anesthesia schools. I really like when people ask questions right away, just stick your hand up and we can talk about things right in the middle of the presentation. Doesn't bother me at all, actually well. <coughs> so, the big thing, one of the first questions people ask is, is there enough room for brood in a single brood box? Do you need to have two boxes to get a lot of bees? You don't. Um, this is some math that I stole from Devin Ron. He's got a really fantastic blog on uh, YouTube, and it's about all kinds of things. One of the things he talks about is single brood box management in Ontario, Canada. One nine and five eighths frame, that's a deep, has 7,040 cells on it. Both sides? Both sides. Yeah, that is both sides. So you have over 70,000 cells in that deep. Peak laying rate is around 1,500, even if, even if you do the math in your head and figure she's really cooking at 2,000 a day, she's not going to be able to outlay that box. If she's doing a steady 1,500 a day, every single day for 21 straight days, which isn't always that common anyway, she can only fill 31,500 cells with eggs in the 21 days it takes for the first ones she laid to start to emerge 
And the first thing they do when they emerge is they turn around and they clean their cell out and they make it ready for another egg. So this is really a, a realistic idea of how many cells she's going to use for brood at any one time. So you'll have a little more than half of that box filled up with brood. And then the rest is going to be the things you need to raise brood. It's going to be brie bread. It's going to be pollen. You're going to have that nice little ring of honey and nectar around the outside. You know, and your medium, not your medium, your middle frames, they could likely be that nice solid brood pattern you like to see where it's capped out brood from end to end. Because in nature, the brood nest is kind of a sphere. So when you get out to the ends, then you start to see the rings of pollen and honey and everything as it goes out. So that's enough space for all that stuff. Is there enough room in an eight frame? In an eight frame? Eight. Eight frame deep. So let's subtract 14,000 from 70,000. 60, that's 56,000. You still have 20 something thousand extra. Okay. So it would be worth trying. I haven't done it. <laughs> um, there are people who do it though. Okay. Good. I, I think the. Uh, I think that Vino Farms guy runs eight frames. I don't know if anybody watches him. Um, and what I'll say about YouTube, I'll mention different things from YouTube. Just because I mentioned somebody's name, does that mean take everything they ever do on YouTube for gospel? I talk about like the one thing they do. So. Um, what you have to remember about that is like a couple of people, um, uh, the Vino Farms guy and um, this Emmy person live in New England, so their weather's very different, so don't do exactly what they do. We're in a different climate. Queen excluders. Like I said, queen excluders are one of those hot button issues. If you're going to do a single brood box, you have to use a queen excluder. Otherwise, when you put a super on, you're going to have more than one brood box. She's going to move up. You're going to have two or three brood boxes then. So the idea is you keep her in that box with the queen excluder, and then all your honey is above that. So if your goal is the honey and not to have headaches with brood in it and so forth, you got to have that queen excluder. Um, it keeps the uh, managed area in the colony under the queen excluder. What do I mean by managed area? The area that you have to try and keep Varroa out of brood. The area that you're trying to keep hive beetles under control and wax moths and all the other things that bees routinely patrol for. Some people call queen excluders honey excluders. How many of you heard that, honey excluder? <laughs> I've heard that a lot. There hasn't been a study yet to show that that's true. Um, they still go through there and they put honey in and it's comparable. Beekeepers do what all people do when it comes to trying to spot trends is they take their personal experience and then extrapolate from that out to everything. And even if you're running 30 hives, 40 hives, you know, a pretty heavy hobbyist, that's still a really small sample and it depends on what your weather was like, depends on what it was like the year you did that how much disease your bees had, how bad the varroa was, how much the hive beetles were eating, so on and so on. Um, so when you do really big math data on this across the country, several years, they don't find a difference. If you are worried about um, the queen excluder cutting down on the amount of honey that you're making, I did read one article that said you can put an upper entrance on there and there's moderately significant information that your honey production could be a little higher if you have an upper entrance that's small, not as big as the bottom one, otherwise you're going to have a robbing frenzy. But if you have a small entrance they can guard and they can come in there with the nectar instead of have to go all the way through the hive, it might increase your honey production a little bit. And I tried this on a couple hives this year. I put ventilated medicine rings on all my hives. They're um, one and a half by a half 
I drill a hole in there and I staple a screen on each hole to keep bad guys out. I'll pull one of the screens off in each one to make an upper entrance. And then I use that to ventilate during the year with open bottom boards and during the winter to keep things dry, except I slide the board in on my screen bottom boards. So, uh, the Quinn Excluder is also part of the integrated pest management system. You guys talk about that, IPM. All the things you do as an entire system to cut down on the amount of varroa that you're carrying in your hive. Um, the theory is that some of those mites get knocked off as the workers squeeze through. Mm. I tend to use the plastic queen excluders. They do get cracked, they go bad, the sun doesn't like them, but they're cheap, so they're not too bad to replace. And the metal ones, if they get bent just a little bit, that queen can scoot through there, and all of a sudden you have brood up top. So. Um, I think that's a little better if you buy the really pricey ones that have the wood around the edge and the metal in the middle. But I don't do that. I, I have like 15 hives, so if I buy 15 of those, all of a sudden it starts to look like more money. Is there enough room for winter food in a single box? Yeah, there is. Um, University of Guelph and Devon Ron are both in Ontario, and they both run single brood boxes. <coughs> And they do it in southern Canada, so we certainly have enough food down here. There are some things you have to think about. <coughs> um, one deep frame holds six pounds of honey. Pick that up, think it's really heavy, that's six pounds of honey. So a deep box, if there's nothing but honey in there, 60 pounds of honey. Our bees need about 40 pounds to get through the winter. So. Nevada is a little further than Joplin is. Pittsburgh is a little further. The guys in the Nevada club say they have a significantly, significantly colder winter than we do in Joplin. I, um, so what you have to do when you do single brood boxes is you have to feed your bees. You, you just have to because you will pull your honey in the summer and then you're going to be staring at a dearth. And depending on how much you took off when you harvested, you need to give them food back or they can starve to death in the summer just like they can in the winter. Um, and the thing about that is you think, well, I'm spending money on that sugar. <coughs> if you're selling honey, you sell your honey for a lot more than you buy cane sugar for, especially if you shop around. <coughs> If you feed sugar candy, box and pollen patties, that'll help in the late winter, early spring, stimulate your brood production. Um, put that right on top. I leave the uh, queen excluder in there the whole time, and that suppresses their urge to fill that ventilation ring with new comb, and also gives me somewhere to lay those sugar blocks or their po those pollen patties. Um, another thing about winter, um, one of your biggest enemies in the winter is moisture. So if you have a relatively small cluster and they generate heat and they're close to the bottom box and it comes up into a full double deep in the top, there'll be some moisture in there and then it'll hit the cold in the upper box and that moisture will fall out and then start to kind of run back down or collect inside the hive. And moisture is really, really bad for them. That's why I ventilate quite a bit. Um, a lot of people think their bees freeze. Most often they don't freeze. They can keep themselves warm, but they starve or they die of disease during the winter. Um, and when you're in that single brood box, they're less likely to get themselves stranded into a position where there's a lot of food in the box but all of a sudden it got really cold and they clustered too far away to get to it and it's really cold for a couple weeks and they can't get to their food and they die. Have any of you seen that in your boxes before? Is there room for all your bees in one brood box? Probably not. Um, I had a bunch of bearding in some of my hives. I tried Saskatraz for the first time this year and they can make some bees. <laughs> They're kind of like my friends Italians. They make a lot of bees. Um, I put on extra supers 
just to keep the bees inside the colony doing the work they're supposed to instead of hanging out outside trying to cool off. Um, so you can add supers for room and just store honey. So uh, you use the same rules for adding a super. When there are seven or eight frames of bees, you should add a box. So seven or eight frames of bees, not necessarily, you know, there's usually seven or eight frames of wax. <laughs> Um, and I talked about the bearding. So, any questions about where we are so far? Let's talk about when, when when you go down, and I assume you're talking about when you uh, start removing your honey supers to prepare for winter. Yeah. You get to remove all your honey supers off, and like I've got some three and four high right now mm -hmm. that are just busting the bees all the way through it. That's been one of my concerns. Yeah. But they'll figure it out. I, the way I understand it, they'll get it figured out once you knock them down to one story. Well, yeah, you knock them down to one story, and those three or four supers full of bees, um, now you're talking about pulling the boxes off now? No, no. Like September-ish? Yeah, end of September. Yeah, end of September. Those bees are not likely the bees that are going to go through the winter anyway. Correct. Correct. So they're going to sort that out. Uh, the queen's going to lay her winter bees that are a little bit bigger, they have bigger, fatter bo fat bodies in them, and are built to live that length of the winter. And those three or four supers full of bees are going to work themselves to death trying to fill your box with honey for the winter. Mm -hmm. And they're just gonna drop off and slowly die. So I've been working with two brood boxes, and, and like I say, when I'm thinking about this, this is one of my concerns, because when I knock my bees down to two brood boxes, I always have some major bearding mm -hmm. and for two, a week or two, and then it seems like it kind of disappears. Mm -hmm. uh, but they beard at night, they, but once it starts getting cold, they seem to all fit or they're dying off or whatever they're doing. Yeah. And if you're super But the one super, when the one box, they do the same, they'll get worked in where they get all get in there? Yeah, they will, and if you're really concerned about it, even if they're just making a little bit of honey, you could leave a super on there with the queen excluder until the numbers start to come down, um, and they can't guard or patrol that space anymore. And if they've made any nectar or honey, honey up there, just put that box out 100 yards away from all your hives and let them rob it back into your singles. Okay. So I, I do a fair amount of letting them rob back unfinished stuff um, to get they the don't tear your thumbs up. Hmm? They don't tear your thumbs up. Mm. Most of it isn't capped. It yeah. is like part of it. If it if there's anything that's capped, that gets torn up more. The uncapped stuff, it's not too bad, and they fix it up pretty quick when you put it back on. What one of the questions you talked about feeding? <coughs> if I'm understanding the single brood correctly, when we remove our honey supers off right. and get those off. It's pretty important almost immediately, from what I'm understanding, to feed two to four gallons of feed back to each individual hive mm -hmm. to fill up all the, 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 all the empty spaces and fill in behind the queen. Yeah. Is that what you're finding, is two to four gallons? Or are you doing open feeding out here and let them... I, I do open feeding. Do you? Um, with the 15 colonies, it just turns into a giant pain to try and internally feed 15 colonies. So I do open feeding about 100 yards away and I have a station set up where I have, you know, I put my hives on cinder blocks, <coughs> cinder blocks and then uh, landscaping ties on there and set three for every eight feet of landscaping tie. Um, for feeding, um, I actually pay a little bit more and I get the treated four by fours because, and I pick out straight ones because I open feed with the five gallon buckets and the rule of thumb I use is I try and set out four gallons for every colony. I make about four gallons in every five gallon bucket because you know you drill those holes around the rim so you can't fill it all the way up and I don't want to spill sugar water on my feet all the time. So then you flip that over and you just watch them and so I have 15 colonies right now and I put four buckets on there. So I'll turn that over 
four times at least. And then I'll take a look, and if anybody's really short, like they haven't been able to get their fair share, then I would turn to do some internal feeding to try and balance it out. How do you do your internal feeding? Um, do you use buckets on top, upside down, or do you uh, have frame feeders? Or I, I tried those fancy blue and white things you find on Amazon once. They got the blue ring and you set the thing on there. Those are great for grounding bees. Those are super for ground feeders or something on them. So I don't do that. I, I use those black pans that kind of set into a frame box that you can put a couple gallons in. So a top feeder. Yeah, just a top feeder. You could you could do the one or two gallon bucket thing too and put it on there and that would work. That's well. the direction I think I'm heading. Yeah. At, but, at this point. But don't don't move full frames of cap sugar syrup or honey from colony to colony. I tried that once and um, that colony was dead pretty quick because all it takes is one or two bees to make it over there on there and go back and tell all their friends that this full frame is in there and if the colony isn't that strong they'll rob, they'll rob out the whole box. In a heartbeat. Yeah, I lost the whole box that way in the middle of summer once. Because I thought, eh, there's not much in this box. It's probably all like 20, 21% water. It's just really loose nectar. I'll just stick it on top of here. Don't do that. <laughs> they robbed everything out. They didn't just, they couldn't defend themselves. So I would, and it wasn't that bad of a heartbreak. They, they were a split that I really didn't intend on making anyway, but all of a sudden I went out and, holy crap, there's a lot of bees and queen cells in here. I gotta do something before I lose half the hive, so. But it was a lesson learned. Um, did you well, have a question? One question. Yeah. When you're extracting and you have, you want to clean up your frames, how far away are you putting them? To I try and put that stuff like 100 yards away. If I can. Now, I live in the country. I got 22 acres. Yeah. I know people that will put that stuff closer if they're in town and stuff. And if, if you only have a couple of colonies, chances of robbing are a little bit less. But I have some extraordinarily strong colonies and some colonies I'm still evaluating if I need to just combine them with somebody else so they can make it through the winter. Some of the splits that got made later in the year. I mean, we're just talking about clean out. <coughs> yeah, just, just cleaning up. Just cleaning up, you know, yeah. just one of the. Okay. It annoys my wife a little bit how I do this because I have a shed where I keep all my boxes and stuff, mm -hmm. and I have a wood splitter parked outside that. And <laughs> I don't want to put the stuff that's robbing out on the ground because grass and everything gets on the bottom. So I stick it on the wood splitter. She has to, my wife doesn't love bees like I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she has to walk from the garage. To her horse barn. Now I don't love the horse like she does either, so it's, it's fair. Even that. <laughs> it's, it's fair. And uh, <laughs> but she has to walk past bees. Not smart, but fair. And they, uh, I think they know how she feels about them. Yeah. <laughs> she she's done things like I, I had a really angry colony last year, and I came back to the house wearing my bee suit, surrounded by bees, of course. And she thinks, oh, cool. Let me take a picture of you. And it only took about two minutes for them to realize another person was within stinging distance. So she, she was doing the bee dance. And she, so, so I think they like redheads better. Okay, so hive, mites, beetles, pest control. This is all a big deal. Um, I have not kept bees long enough to have been in the magical era 30 years ago where you just put some bees out there and Three months later, you had a ton of honey, I was. And, and you didn't have to do it anything. Was nice. It was just magic, I hear. It was just beautiful. And if you didn't want to work them for two years, you come back two years later, they're still there. Yeah, they're still there, and they're still doing their thing. Yeah. yeah. Not anymore. And what came first? Was it the wax moths first? The wax moths have always been here. Yeah. They've always been a pest. That, that, was our only, that was our only pest. That's just the problem when your hive gets weak. Yeah. If they're strong, they keep them out. That's right. Yeah. But that's always been since I can remember. But when I got out of it and got back in in early but 2000s, that's these when guys the hive beetles. And Our friend, the Varroa Disruptor. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, hive beetles came before that. Yeah. And, and, and now, 
you don't worry about hive beetles that much as long as your colony is strong. I mean, we put traps out and stuff, but we don't feel like we have to try and kill every single, it would be nice to, but you don't have to. Mites suck. Yeah. They're terrible. Oh, speaking of mites, did you guys read the uh, recent article in Anthropology Today? Um, what do you guys think mites eat on the bees when they're attached? What are they eating? It's not the blood. No, they are not surviving off the hemolymph. But they just found this out. Yeah, they just found this out like in the last month. <coughs> they feed right off the fatty bodies. So that sucks away the energy reserve from the bees. still under their bodies. Yeah, and that explains why they get so lazy and have a hard time doing anything when they have all their fatty bodies eaten away. I need some raw mites to suck away my fatty bodies. <laughs> I'll be happy. Okay, so most pest treatments you do are dosed by frame of bees. So one advantage of single brood bonds is half of the cost of treatment. So treatments are expensive and beekeepers are cheap. Cheap, 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 cheap. I came up with this great idea. Um, I, I figured out how to test for nosema, and I thought, all right, I'm gonna put ads in our national journals, and people are gonna send me their bees, and they're gonna send me 50 bucks, or I'm gonna give them a nosema report, and it's gonna be great. And I asked Randy Oliver about it, and he said, well, you know, in theory, that's a great idea, but it's hard enough to get beekeepers to pay the postage to send them to me to test for free. So I never really did that. But it was, it was going to be like my retirement thing. I'm going to test for nosema. I'll go to people's houses and shake for mites, and it'll be great. No, nobody wants to pay for anything. Um, so one brood box is half so much space. So let's say you're doing apivar and it wants one strip for every five frames. So that's two frames for single brood box management because you put this stuff on after you pull your supers, right? If you have double brood box, that's four, and apivar is not cheap. And then might away quick strips, they aren't cheap either. And <coughs> what's, what's the natural version of this stuff? Um, B, what was that? Hopguard. Yeah, Hopguard. Hopguard is really pricey. So if you do Hopguard on two boxes, that's even more. So this will cut down some of your costs. Um, one box is easier to keep warm in the spring. You know, let's say you have a queen that just gets raring right away. Like she starts laying a significant amount, maybe February. I mean, they'll all maybe start a little bit in January if it gets warm enough. But you have somebody who really takes off in February, it's easier to keep that one box warm enough and avoid some of the chill brood than it is having double boxes and let's say she's laid over a bigger area. And I like to think about <clears throat> this part, less frames to move on inspection. Um, when it's 93 degrees out there and I have to wear my bee suit, and I don't know if you guys do this, but I put my hives in the place I would least likely stand when it's 95 degrees. It's sunny, it's, it, I mean, it's in full sun all the time to keep down the hive beetles. And you're standing there and all of a sudden you have 20 frames to go through instead of 10. <laughs> and you've got to move a deep every time. And it takes twice as long, it's twice as many frames. Sorry. Phone keeps ringing like somebody's dying. I'll get it later. It, it's the Joplin Club from their class. I hope nobody died at the class. Um, so I, I keep that in mind. And if you're moving less frames around, you're less likely to squish your bees. That has been found to be a great way to spread no semen in your hives is if you squish mm -hmm. bees during your inspections. So. Not only should you be a gentle keeper, beekeeper, just to be a gentle beekeeper, when you squish bees, and if it has no SEMA, the other bees, the housekeeping bees, come and clean that up by licking it all up, and the no SEMA goes right into their gut, and then bees are swapping stuff all the time, swapping 
um, nectar and, and other things, and it'll spread through your hive pretty quick. And it just, it doesn't outright kill the hive, but it just is a constant drag on their performance because it disrupts their nutrition. So if you have less frames to move, you're less likely to cause that. <coughs> Close assessment I could find was eight pounds of honey to make a pound of wax. Does anybody have a better number than that? That's the best I could find. That's the one I've always gone with. So that's, that's <laughs> more than a full deep frame of honey. Which is a significant amount of honey to make a pound of wax. This is four or five drawn out deep frames. 16 pounds of honey for a full deep. At $7 a pound, which is basically the upper end of the market value right now in the American Bee Journal and Bee Culture, it's $112 worth of honey to draw out another box. So this drawn out extra box and also, you have to assume that you're going to rotate your comb, right? Because you, if you don't rotate your comb, then you're accumulating any pesticides or herbicides that are coming in on the bee's feet. You know, that comb gets black because that's walking in the house with your shoes on, on brand new white carpet. So all that stuff's getting off on there, and all your treatments are accumulating in there. So you got to rotate that wax out every so often. Well, if you have two boxes, of wax to rotate out, that's a bigger drag in the amount of honey you're going to collect. Um, it's a lot of resources. It takes a lot of trips from a lot of bees to make even a tablespoon of honey. So this is not an inconsiderate consideration. More honey stored in the supers in a single in single brood box management. Bees move honey back and forth all the time. If they need room for brood, they will move stuff back and forth. Um, oh, just want to make a note. It's, it's okay if people take pictures. I've noticed this. Um, I thought of it because you were taking pictures. I'm recording this for our club, and it's going to go up on our club's website, and the entire presentation is going to be on YouTube, and we'll have the link to it on the joplinareabeekeepers.com website if you want to review anything, but it's, it's okay to take pictures. I don't know why you want a picture of me, but you can take pictures of slides. Um, I got a question. Are you using the deep and then are you using medium supers? Yes. I've, I've done single box, but I didn't, and that's the way we did it. Mm -hmm. But now we do deeps and we use deeps for our supers. You can. You still do that with a single? I've never tried it with a single. I'd like to try um, You know, um, the first <clears throat> half of this year with those Saskatraz, I wound up putting two mediums on there. So, um, in a couple weeks I'm going to pull my supers and I've got deeps sitting on those just because they were busy and did so much. So, um, and if you're concerned about weight, moving supers, not, not you but I anybody, know what you're saying, but um, you could put three shallows on there. Mine is more just because it's nice to have all your frames the same size. For it is. That's pretty awesome. We got rid of every medium that we had. So. Now, you can do this system in all mediums if you want to. Mm -hmm. Just do two mediums for your single brood chamber. Right. Mm. I mean, you're still going to go through 20 frames, but mm -hmm. it's going to be lighter, which is what most people yeah. are trying to achieve when they go to two mediums. Um, so... Let's see, they move the honey back and forth. Um, less is made to wax. Oh, yeah, less of the honey is turned into wax. Um, you got to feed sugar syrup in summer and in the fall flow. Um, honey costs more than sugar and pollen. In a double brood box, there's a lot bigger ring of honey around the brood, and that's honey you can't really harvest, right? They get a bigger brood nest, it's kind of, it's that sphere, and more of the honey is tied up around that brood nest. And you could harvest it if you wanted to sacrifice all that brood, but people usually don't do that. It's not a super ethical way to do it. 
Um, the only thing like that I've heard about is the people that are up in Alaska that run bees, and they count on not overwintering, and they just take everything every year because they won't overwinter. Mm. Um, you made the statement you you have to feed your bees during the summer after you remove your honey. <coughs> yeah. But you got to leave them in a one box to feed them, right? Yeah. You can't put a honey super on and feed them because they're not going to in your honey super. Right. So yeah. you knock them down to one box in the middle of summer. And, and if and you feed. need if you need space, I think what you're getting at is space for the bees. <coughs> yeah, I'm getting they're, yeah. they're 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 at peak performance. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're and that's where I'm. I think my, uh, this is my thought. <coughs> I think it would be better because typically you have like a couple. I do. I run deeps also. Yeah. All the way, and uh, I'm running 150 colonies. Right. And yes. when I do the uh, well, 140 production ice. but uh, you always have one box that's not quite full. Mm -hmm. I would think that you would just remove the full box, and you you'd almost need to leave the other box for the honey stores for the summer, and you wouldn't want to feed. I'm, I, I guess I'm not understanding why you feed them. <coughs> well, in the dirt. In the dirt. In the dirt. In the dirt. So, um, I think this comes up on the next slide. When you are doing a single box, you really have to watch your hives. Every week, every two weeks, just take a look at least. And if you're finding that your boxes, your boxes are full, stop feeding until they consume some of that. Now, if you miss that, and you have a super on just in case, and they fill it up with syrup, you can put that out to be robbed out. Yeah. And that was my concern. And they'll take it I was back. just trying to understand more what you do at that point. So yeah, plan A, is, what I was plan A is to keep an eye on where they are, mm -hmm. so they don't start filling that up. And then plan B is if they do, you can just let them rob that out back. And that might even even out some of your hives if you have one that is a little shorter on food. Yeah. So, but you really have to keep an eye on them. Um, inspection ease. You have as many bees as you do in a double box. I mean, she doesn't lay less because you only have a single brood. Um, when you do an inspection, you only have 10 frames to look at. Um, Big deal when it's a hot out, when it's hot out. Um, you just have to take the super off to get it. your brood chamber. You don't have to take a super off, look at the top half of the brood chamber, move the top half of the brood chamber, look at the bottom half of the brood chamber. Must feed, you need to keep an eye on how much food they have. Um, the other risk about feeding is um, if you don't have enough space, they can get syrup bound. And then you gotta start pulling frames, you know, where the queen doesn't have anywhere to lay because they're storing all the syrup in the dirt. Mm -hmm. So you gotta pull frames out and you have to have frames available to put in there. Now do you knock yours down to one story during the dearth? Am yeah. I, am I, is that what I'm understanding? I do. Okay. I do. And you know, this year because of all the rain, Man, I, I had to feed pretty, I had some pretty light boxes at one point. I had to feed pretty aggressively. I mean, you have some propolis holding your lid down, and you knock that and the whole box moves. You know there's not much food in there. <coughs> so then you got to feed pretty aggressively. That happens. So, and that happened on splits that got made in like June. Those weren't the ones that were more established. Sure, I, yeah, I understand. I told you about my ventilated medicine rings. Um, it's nice to be able to put pollen patties on there and sugar candy. It's nice to keep it a little cooler in there. I don't know if you get, do you guys run solid bottom boards or screened most of the time? Screened. Screened. Solid. Yeah. I run solid. Solid. Solids. Whatever. Yeah. And it's just whatever you do. Yeah. You, you can put the ventilation rings on the solid bottom boards too, because that's what my hives look like in the winter. I. I slide the board in there for the winter. I have a friend that leaves that out all winter. Um, but he runs Italians, and they have a brood nest like this. They're just dumb. <laughs> I don't know when to quit laying. Yeah. That's why I don't like them. Yeah, they're just going on styles. And I, I do, 
almost all carniolans, and I've got some Saskatraz this year just because I wanted to try them out. Just what, do you, what do you think of the, not the changers, what do you think oh. of the Saskatraz? You know, two of my Saskatraz are really kind of pissy. Um, they're just really busy and they run around a lot on the frames, but they made a lot of bees. They draw out frames like crazy and they make honey, but they're, they're a busy bee. Um, and I haven't overwintered them yet. So just personality wise, that's the difference. My carniolans are more chill. You know, they, they don't run around on the frames as much. They just keep doing whatever they're doing when I take them out. They shut down early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they are more in tune with what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Saskatraz queens were laying like crazy in the dearth. Where are they from? I don't know. Um, they are a breed that was developed in Southwest Canada. And they're about 60% carniola and 40% a bunch of other stuff. And they were bred to have high brood rearing rate and high honey production. And they're supposed to be gentle. Now, when I say they're prissier than my other bees, they are. They're not super aggressive. I don't have a cloud following me back to the house. But I would never open the box wearing just my veil on those bees. And most of my carniolans, I could just wear a veil and open the box. Mm -hmm. But if I started to work the Saskatraz with bare hands and a t-shirt, I'd take a bunch of hits. And that's two of them. There's one of them that's pretty gentle. And the other two are kind of in between. So I'm running five of those. Man, I'm um, brave enough to wear anything but my garb in <laughs> What's that? I feel like I have to wear my garb all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, because I have those two in runs. my bee yard, I do wear the full suit every time. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Downsides to double brew boxes. Now, I'm not trying to run double brew boxes into the ground, but these are things to consider that you don't have to deal with anymore if you go to single brew boxes. Um, you should sw switch your boxes every spring to make sure that the queen starts laying the other box, right? Switch those over. If you're not the attentive beekeeper that's going to do this, then you're getting rid of one of your advantages of having double brood boxes. Um, if you move your hives around, if you're one of these people that tries to chase the flow and follow the flow, it's a lot harder to use <coughs> double brood boxes to do this. And at night, it's pretty dang exciting when you have your white lights on so you can see and you have boxes come apart. You know, they, they're coming to you. They don't. And they've done that. Yeah, they, they don't know where the box is anymore, so they follow the light. Um, double brood boxes are taller. Um, some people lower the hives closer to the ground to combat that. You know, some of the people who, I, I tell patients who are short that God only lets things grow till they're perfect. So if you're a more perfect beekeeper and you keep your stuff closer to the ground so you can reach the top once you get a couple supers and stuff on there, you're putting your entrance closer to the skunks and the possums and they don't have to get up like this to get inside and get their belly stung. <coughs> so, um, saw a really cool video the other day. Smartest skunk I ever saw. Um, <coughs> guy knew that a skunk was eating his bees because he was finding them around the hive in the morning. <coughs> and, uh, and there was an area of mud in the front where the skunk had been working on the hive skunk footprints. Smart skunk. Screen bottom board. He would come up and he'd scratch at that. And the bees would come out and it's dark up so they would get lost and they'd land in the grass. And he'd walk over and eat them out of the grass. And he wouldn't stand up on his back legs. And <clears throat> the maker of the video decided this skunk isn't worth killing. Um, now he sat 10 feet away from all this happening. He was just going out to put the camera out, and the skunk showed up when he was out there. So the skunk didn't know he was there. He's shooting the video. And he decided the skunk isn't worth trapping or killing because it's eating maybe 40, 50 bees a night, and more bees than that are dying out of your hive every day. 
it's, it's sad to think of as a new beekeeper. I have 50 bees die every day if it's more than that. So he's just leaving the skunk alone because it leaves after about a half hour. <clears throat> 20 frames per box sometimes decreases your rate of wax swap out, which increases the rate of toxic toxin accumulation in your wax. You know, when when you buy, how many of you guys have bought nukes? You guys buy nukes or packages as a club? So when you buy nukes, how often do you get really nice, white, clean wax with your nuke? That nuke is part of your nuke producer's wax swap out program. So, you know, within a year you should try and swap that out when you can. But you don't want to have wax like that in your hive all the time because it does cut down on your bee production and health studies have shown that. Downsides to single box management. There's downsides to everything. You know, I have, I have patients who show up for anesthesia. I do anesthesia for a living and they say, man, I really want something to drink. And I say, you can have something to drink. And they say, really? I say, yeah, but you can't have surgery today. <laughs> it's all about choices. So you just got to make your choice here. It takes a lot more attentiveness. Hmm. Now, I think this is a good thing for new beekeepers to have to be attentive. Um, this person with the Langstroth we were talking about, her hive has been inspected twice this year, and I was there both times. Otherwise, she's got windows on the side, and she's thinking an inspection is open the window up and look in the side. And she'll probably watch this video, and she knows I'm talking about her, because I talk about this with her, so that's okay. And um, you have to really be involved in your bees when you do this. And I think that's a good thing. You know, beekeeping is a beautiful thing. If you get to know your bees and watch what they're doing, they're just remarkable. I mean, you've got 50,000 of these guys all working for one goal, and they're all just like genetically programmed to do it. It's awesome. Um, I've got a talk I do about the genetics of beekeeping, and that plays a huge role in how the whole hive functions. It's great. So you have to get in there and do it, and I think this is a good thing for new beekeepers. Um, the person with the Langstroth hive, she was so happy a couple weeks ago when I was at her place, and she did her inspection, and she saw all these things, and I showed her eggs, and I showed her drones, and I showed her where the queen was. And all these things going on, she says, oh, that's so much more than I saw through the window. I said, that's right. That's why we do this. So it's worth it to do. This is the fun of beekeeping. The fun of, I don't think the fun of beekeeping is honey extraction. That's a sticky mess. <laughs> so you have to inspect your hives when it's hot out. I talked about that. You have to, you have to put some kind of protection on. You have to stand in the sun. Um, this year I've switched to tolerating more bees being in the hive and inspecting them at 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning than doing it at 1 or 2 o'clock when there's more foragers out just so I can stand to be out there and do a better job of what I'm out there to do. And I also want smokerless this year, which is like a whole another topic. I've, I've decided I'm not going to use the smoker because then I see their behavior that doesn't involve running around after they've been smoked. Um, whole another interesting experiment to try. So. What do you use? Do you use a spray, like sugar water spray bottle? Mm -hmm. Nothing? I don't use anything. No. Don't use anything. I, I hate a smoker. No, it's another thing that's hot out there. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> and it, it, it changes their behavior. It changes the bees' behavior so much, sometimes it's hard to figure out what's going on. I have an easier time spotting queens when I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's not running around and she's not running around, and if you find the couple frames that have new eggs that have just tipped over or standing on their end, you know she's probably around there somewhere. And I've noticed not using a smoker, if I look at the top of the brood box, usually the queen is under this area I call the bullseye now, because there's like this sphere of activity going on around the queen, but that sphere doesn't become complete. It comes up to the top of the brood box, and then there's a circle there. Usually the queen is within a couple of those frames. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really helped my insight a lot to not smoke my bees and not put sugar water on them. And, but when I do cutouts, you bet your butt I smoke bees. 
because I'm tearing apart their home and they don't like it. So, so. Um, you have to watch your population to avoid swarms. We didn't talk about swarms very much. But when you have a single brood chamber, you really got to be on top of your swarm game. You, when you start to see the population get dense, you get to your seven or eight frames of bees, you need to be getting supers on there and you still have to watch for queen cells. And I keep eight nuke boxes around my place so that if I need, if I go out and do an inspection, I need to make a split, I have a box to do it in. And I also have um, 10 follow boards. That's a device that's typically used inside a top bar hive to keep the bees dense so they can patrol all their area. I had follow boards made for my Langstroth hives, so if I'm out of nukes, I can use follow boards and that presses the density of the bees as the colony grows and the queen lays more when it's a little denser. You know, if you put four frames of bees into ten frames, sometimes they have, a, you ever notice they're kind of slow to get going? If I condense them to about six or seven frames, she'll lay more. <coughs> This approach is not good for bee havers. Um, this is how you know I talked to Dale Foley. Bee havers is one of his sayings. A bee haver is somebody who has boxes in their yard and they watch the bees go in and out and, and that's what they do. That's what their goal is and that's okay. But if you're going to be that beekeeper, that bee haver where you know, like, like my good friend Linda, I love her to death, she's got the top bar hive. She's happy feeding her bees and looking in the window and, and, and stuff. So a single brood box might not be the best plan for her or for anybody in this room who has that goal. If you just want to have a box full of pollinators helping the world, you don't have to do single brood box. You can do double. It's okay. I won't judge you. Nobody else should either. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying that they do require a lot more work. You have to stand more often to look at them. So are you saying that every week to two weeks you actually go all the way to the brood box and check it out every time you get in there? Yeah. How do you, you go from two yeah, to there's single? Only one. What do you do with that top brood? I don't go through all the supers. I just move the supers to the okay. side. Because you have the queen excluder. So all it is is workers up there storing away nectar and making honey and stuff so um, I look at them through the top to see if there's anything really obvious going wrong but I don't pull all the frames out and they get a little crooked because I put nine frames in my supers because the math and the stats show you collect more honey if you put nine in there and space them out more than if you stick ten in so they get a little crooked in the fur comb and stuff, and it's hard to put them back in, so I try not to take a lot of them out until I harvest them. You ever tried nine frame spacers, the metal piece? They're cheap. I no, love, but I've, I've I thought love. about it many times when I was standing out there. Well worth the money. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll buy some of those and install them this winter. Yeah. I went to that, and I love it. Cheap? How cheap? Buck a box. Buck a box. Hey, if a guy who has a hundred and fifty hives says they're cheap and he uses them, I think I'll probably buy them. <laughs> Is single brood box religion or cult? No. Like I said in the beginning, you should manage your bees how you want to and how it makes you happy. This is another way to do it. Uh, combining a weak hive with a strong hive makes it a double brood chamber. And sometimes you have to do this in the fall. Um, take your losses in the fall. Don't let these things die off over the winter when you could have had the opportunity to take two so-so colonies, combine them, you know, stick a sheet of newspaper on there, stick a box on top of the other one, let them get to know each other, and then keep each other warm all winter, and at least one, you have one colony that survives instead of maybe having two that die. So you end up doing that sometimes. Um, if you do that and they come out strong, you can split them back into single brood boxes the next spring. And if you have to do this in the spring, you can split them back out into single brood boxes in the summer. So, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes you have to make a double brood box. I'm weighing whether or not to take those two really super productive, really dense 
60,000 bee boxes and run them as doubles this winter because they just have so much going on and they've stored so much food mm -hmm. with an eye toward making splits next spring, <clears throat> increasing my apiary and selling some nukes. Uh, there are other special circumstances to do double brew boxes. Some people do this to bank queens. Some people will make a double brew <coughs> box and stick in a, a queen excluder in there <coughs> to be able to start or finish off queen cells and queen production. There's all kinds of different bee method things you do that people use double boxes for. Um, start with a few hives if you're unsure. Like Ron was saying, you start with a few. If you try a few and you don't like it, go back to doubles. If you like it, do more. People always tinker around with what they're doing. It's, it's a hobby. It's supposed to be fun. Do, do what you want to do. So, any questions? Yeah. Well, if you have two brews, exactly what do you do to get it down to one? Oh, so you, you, wait, wait till spring. Okay. Well, you can make a split. Um, earlier in the year. Okay. Don't do that on September 5th. Okay. Good luck getting a queen. Good luck making a queen on September right. 5th. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of drones in boxes right now when I go to other people's houses. The only, the only hive I've seen a bunch of drones in uh, recently is the top bar, but they are more prone to making more drones than Langstroths are. So there's. You, know, so you do this in the spring. You don't do it. You, you could split them up and, I mean, if you take a double through the winter by late March, early April-ish, you could probably split them if you got a queen. You want to have a queen because there's not going to be colonies making a lot of drones, so if you have them try and make their own queen, she might not come back mated or she might come back <coughs> mated poorly and the workers know that, and you'll just have to deal with a bunch of super procedures. Mm -hmm. So the day to order queens was two days ago. Um, all the big queen producers, they start taking orders for next spring the day after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. So if you call them this week, you could probably still get something ordered. You might be on a wait list. I was on a wait list last year, and I still got my queens. It just depends on how their production goes. So if you have doubles now and you want to try this, don't make it happen until next spring. That's my advice. This is just a statement. Yeah. Eight to ten years ago at Joplin Beach Club, this became a real controversy, uh -huh. going from singles to doubles. It, it still is a little bit. Yeah. And it was interesting because they taught singles, and Dale was always really a strong proponent of singles. Mm -hmm. Probably still is. He but is. they both work. Yeah. They both work here where we're at yes. well. So it really is, there's a lot of reasons to do it, but a lot of people go to the eight frame because of the weight of the box. Mm -hmm. You know, especially women and trying to pick up boxes on top of boxes and stuff. So this yeah. is another way for less weight bearing um, <coughs> stuff if, you, if that is an issue. I've done it both ways and I, I don't know that one's any different than the other. I think you still have to manage your hives. Yeah, mm -hmm. you do, you still have to manage your hive no matter what you're doing. If you're doing a ware hive, if you're doing a top bar, if for some reason you build a big plexiglass observation hive in your wall and run a tube to the outside, you still have to manage your hives. Um, one of the nice things about this, if you're concerned about weight, is if you're a beekeeper who does not move your colonies around, you can still do a 10 frame, and it just has to stay, you never have to move that, especially if you do, well, <coughs> I do screen bottom boards, so like all the, crap falls out the bottom. But if you do solid bottom boards even, and you decide you want to clean that out once a year, just put another deep box next to it, move your frames over. Well, yeah, move your frames over, and maybe have another bottom board, and maybe move everything once, and just move everything over and shake your stuff out of the bottom. But bees are pretty good at cleaning their own stuff up. That's, that's kind of driven by a human need to have things clean more than the bees do. If they don't clean it, it's time to get a new queen. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some are genetically more yeah. better at cleaning up than others. 
and I have ten. That's one of the things I watch for. If they don't have good genetics for mm -hmm. good housekeeping, they don't have good genetics for a lot of other stuff, like I, grooming each other and, and everything else. I do a talk on genetics, and one of the things about it is um, there isn't a direct genetic connection for honey production. You know, a lot of people say mean bees make more honey. <laughs> that is, mean bees are just mean, and there is a genetic there's a gene for that, making them more defensive. Uh, there is not a gene for making honey, so therefore it certainly isn't linked to being mean. What makes more honey is bees have <clears throat> 14 to 20 sex alleles, and so if a queen is really well bred, you know, she breeds 14 to 40 drones, if she has really good diversity in her sex alleles, she'll have a good division of labor among all the different subgroups of sister bees, and they get all the work done, and they make more honey. So. And you're going to control that by. <laughs> <laughs> there are, that's that's a big long talk. That's I know. Right. Dale Dale can give that talk too. Yeah. I, I know. Yeah, you can do it by uh, instrumental insemination, yeah. um, which is how you develop things like sassafras and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, or you can do it by distributing queens to all the people who live around you so that you have the drones that you really want in your area. Now your configuration that you're talking about, you have a deep, you put on a queen excluder. Uh -huh. Above that you put supers, you put medium supers on that, right? Yeah. So and you can put deep or medium or shallow supers, it doesn't matter. Okay, so for your winter stores, what are you doing? They're in the root chamber. The winter store is going to be at the bottom? Yeah. You cannot put winter stores above a queen excluder. Because you got to take the queen excluder out before the winter. Yeah. So let's say it gets warm, a whole bunch of your bees head up there above the queen excluder, and then it gets cold right away. They'll cluster up there. And the queen Fewer bees will cluster around the queen down mm -hmm. here. She might die. Right. So you can't separate her from the other bees. You have to have all your food below the queen excluder. Is there enough honey? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what he was saying around your friends. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. <laughs> so they're gonna, that's why when you pull your honey, you have to feed yeah. back. You're you feed back, so they're going to fill the You need cell. to make sure there's 40 pounds of food in there. And I also, I'm, we live in an area where it hits 50 degrees or so on a regular basis, off and on, all summer long, all winter long. Mm -hmm. And I will put sugar blocks in there or pollen patties on if it's getting to January or February to stimulate some laying. Um, some people make the candy. Some people, um, man, what's the name for it? It's like a mountain feeding or something. Put a newspaper down there and just pour the sugar on there. And that helps absorb some of the moisture too. And they'll eat that so they'll have a food reserve sitting on top. But they only need 40 pounds. And you can fit 60 pounds of honey in your brood box. Six to seven frames of honey is what you gotta have in the bottom box. Yep. And so what he, what he was saying earlier, if I understand it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, when he pulls his honey off, then he immediately starts to open feed, <coughs> trying to get those bees to fill up all back, <coughs> and the back flow her with 40 pounds of, of, of syrup mm -hmm. or whatever. Because she will be pretty much honeyless down below because she stored the honey up above. You may have one or two frames of honey down below. That's what I'm seeing in my bees. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're pretty well cleaned out, and if you don't come back and feed, as soon as you pull your honey off, that's why you're getting more honey. Yeah, and then right. you need to come back and feed, have, or move frames of honey into your bottom box. And they'll probably just start filling that bottom brood at that point, because like you said, what I see too is they don't really put much honey in that lower box. Right. Anyway. Right. Right, and that's kind of the natural order of things. If you look at when they build in a wall and you see a video of a cutout, one end is brood and the other end is a bunch of honey. Some question up here? Well, now you didn't really touch on, you know, you really need to wait till she starts backing off of brood to feed that sugar back in the bottom box. Yeah, if you do start to feed, you still need to keep an eye on because uh, I mentioned you don't want to get syrup bound. Um, that happened to me this spring. It was raining so much I was open feeding a bunch, and all of a sudden I thought a hive was queenless. 
because I wasn't seeing anything, and the light bulb came on. Oh, everything's syrup in here. So I took those frames out, put some other drawn frames in there, and started laying right away. So yeah, you do have to watch for that. So she has room to lay her winter bees. What's the nine frame space for the viewers? Oh, they they sell at um, Man Lake and Dayton and stuff. Um, go to their website and search nine frame spacer, and it's this strip that has little spaces that are as big as the end of your frames, and that'll space nine frames out evenly in your honey supers. I have some in the back of my truck. Okay. I took off honey this week and I've got some in there. So you it's just to space are. them evenly. Yeah. Yes. But more, but further apart than what you think. It's metal. So yes. they draw the wax out further. Mm -hmm. Put in with two yeah. little. Yeah. You just put a little yeah. screw in each end. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they give them a place to go high. They make a what? You take a torch. They cook a lot of down onto your frame yeah. and it spreads them, and you, you take it to the yeah. yeah, as a tool. It makes it easier to uncap the honey also because it sticks yeah, out faster. So. Yeah. yeah. So would it, so, so okay. So in when you're going to harvest the honey, you want to make sure they've got honey down below. To me, it sounds like you'd want to have your supers the same size as the brood box that we, if you need to take frames of honey, you can put them down below. You could do that. Yeah, yeah it's not typically a strategy people who do single brood box use because um, <coughs> if you sell the honey, you make more money than the sugar syrup it takes to replace it in the okay. lower boxes. You just okay. have to feed right away. But if you want to do that, it will work. Okay. And then you harvest when? When you harvest all that honey on the When the flow ends. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, know, I know people who are harvesting everything right now. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm holding off in hopes that all the soybeans that got planted later right, on to me right. are still producing some nectar. <clears throat> if I'm wrong, the penalty is they will move or consume some of the honey they've already made. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a chance I'm taking. But <coughs> Isn't there their natural honey that they've made much better for the bees than sugar water, if you got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Um, add things like Honey Bee Healthy and add some of those amino acids and things in there. When you do that, they also have pollen, so the protein from the pollen and things make up for some of that as well. But yeah, all things being equal, the honey is better for them. Um, so it, it depends on your goal. If your goal is to be as absolutely natural as possible and not feed, you know, there are beekeepers that think feeding is the worst thing ever. If you're one of those beekeepers, that's okay. It doesn't bother me, but then then maybe this isn't the method for you. No, I just want to, would want to make yeah. sure that they made it through the winter. Yeah. So either you can do what he was saying and run the same size frames in your supers and move the supers down instead of feeding, or run double brood boxes. Evidently feeding works okay, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Right. It does. I, so I have more of kind of a livestock approach to bees, and that's because I know that we brought them to this continent. You know, the Apis mellifera that we use now, they weren't here before Europeans got here. We started with the German honeybee and then switch over to Apis mellifera <coughs> because all the food things we were trying to plant weren't getting pollinated, so we needed the bees. And then people started keeping bees here. So it's kind of a livestock thing to me. It do, they do all these good things also, but I'm managing them to help the environment and to make wax for my mustache wax and to make honey to consume and sell. And Dale Foley actually even um, saves the propolis and makes a tincture and vodka and uses that to paint the inside of his boxes yeah. to help prevent disease in there. Mm -hmm. So all these products. And then you sell bees to other beekeepers. <clears throat> but if your goals are different than that, then, then maybe use a different system. And that's all good. That's right. <coughs> you 
mentioned the no, wood feeders that you grounded a lot of bees with. Yeah. Uh, I was looking into this, their Suricel feeder. I think so. Um, they, they said that it helps a lot to take real coarse sandpaper and sand those areas in the corners where they come in and then on the, in the center where they come in and go down. And they can get in and out better. Uh, the, the ones I'm talking about have like a blue round base yeah. that you set inside a box and then you put a white container of syrup on there and it feels a little, it almost like looks like a, it almost looks like a chicken feeder. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, these are the ones I was talking about was, they're the square ones. You're supposed to put rocks up. around that though, inside yeah. that yeah. lip and it does help or something so that they can walk on. Yeah. Anything else? One last. Yeah. And I'll this talk is, about these all. Uh -huh. The Joplin meeting sometimes, the, the after meeting sometimes goes to 11 or 12 in the parking lot. <laughs> My, I've been, like I said, I've been researching this last two or three years, and and one of the things, and I, I'm a big follower of Ivan Stepler, and uh, and I, I like what he does. Now, now his comments are, you know, he packs them full when he knocks them down to one story. Mm -hmm. And then he fills them up as much as they'll take. Mm -hmm. um, once they got to there, in the springtime, he doesn't have to feed. Are you finding that? I did. Un capping honey and, and uncapping the stores they have and stuff like that. And then he, he splits them. Yeah. And almost eliminates his swarm prevention. Most, most of my feeding this last year. Um, was to help build up the, the nukes that I had purchased. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were there were stores in all my colonies this spring when winter was over. Yeah. So they and that's that's what he was saying yeah. that you should have uh, plenty of stores in the springtime and uncapping the honey yeah. or, or stores would be about the same as feeding. Yeah. It stimulates his brood production and then he mm -hmm. cuts them back to about four or five frames. Yeah. And then takes the rest of it and does splits with them. Yeah. And then then he doesn't have to come back or doesn't come have to come back as much, you know, watch them for swarm prevention. And and the other side benefit of doing that is you make a break in the brood cycle so you knock the varroa back. Yeah. So yeah. No, Put them in nukes and sell them to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Guys, Put just those in nukes. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> My understanding. If people don't get the joke, uh, my understanding is always that when you sell nukes, you put a new queen in the nukes you sell. You don't put your old queen in the nuke. You always supply a new queen. That's the ethical thing to do. So, and and you know what you do, Ron? Huh? Do you put a new queen in your nuke? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I expected Ron to do that. Just, just top guessing. Um, so, and he's saying if you if you take that scraper thing that you buy with a uh, new beekeeper kit. You use that to open up the honey stores inside yeah. because bees don't really like to uncap their honey. If you uncap it for them, then they'll start consuming it. They, they will store, if it's stored, it, it has to be, I have to open it before they open it. Yeah, if they can get anything else anywhere, they they'll do that before they start uncapping. But once you open it, within 24, 48 hours, that frame's empty. Yep. They move it all. Nothing. It's not a question. If you haven't signed the attendance, please do so <laughs> as you leave. Thanks, Debbie. Did, did you Thanks sign me in? I did not sign you in. Thanks, Pat. Not a question. I just want to thank you for coming over. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. And if you're shy, I'm going to be around for a minute. Okay. Doesn't seem like you guys are shy. You're used to. No, we just. They're used to picking on me.